We are going to uh, look at another one of the Protestant groups that uh, came off of, came out of the uh, Catholic Church because of the Reformation. Isn't it something how many different groups come out of the Catholic Church for totally different reasons? Um, as I think of that, I have to think of my own family and our situation. Uh, we were Amish, and of course, if you know, uh, you know, the Amish are very similar in a lot of ways to the Catholics. There's just a lot of the same kinds of uh, beliefs, uh, a lot of emphasis on work salvation and living a certain lifestyle and so on. The Bible, reading the Bible is very discouraged, um, especially if you get to understanding too much at the bottom. They'll literally just tell you, you're studying the Bible too much. <laughs> uh, the problem is the Bible. Isn't that something? But... Um, what you have of those who leave the Amish, uh, they leave for many, many different reasons. The vast majority of people who leave, leave to do what? You go out and live in the world. You know, they're tired of, you know, trying to meet man's rules and standards. And so they want to leave and become whatever they want to. And so usually they go off pretty, pretty wild into the world and trying to live it up. Uh, all the things that have been rejected for all these years, and now they finally get to do what they please, and so they go out to the world. Um, but that's not everybody that leaves the Amish. There's uh, a number of, of those who leave the Amish who go only part way, kind of like those who left the Catholics and, and only went part way. And um, we had a family who in 1983, 84, as we were leaving the Amish, uh, they, they didn't have as much, I mean, they were, they, the parents claimed to believe the Bible. I think they were saved, but they, they didn't go all the way. They immediately got more into the things of the world, and they didn't really go to a good church. They went to a Mennonite church, and they just kind of stagnated there, and almost their entire family now is, is completely in the world. And a uh, number of their kids are divorced and all this kind of thing. So, um, so they came out, but they only went part way. And then my parents and a number of others, when they came out, they were sincerely looking for the truth. They had no idea what these denominations believed. And so uh, we went to that same Mennonite church several times to see what they believed. And they'd sit there arguing about whether a woman should wear a head covering. And they'd argue about, uh, you know, some of the same things that we had argued about in the Amish, you know, the length of the head covering and how much it should, it just all uh, this ridiculousness. And I remember my parents said, that's not biblical. We're leaving that church. We're not coming back to that church. Um, so anyway, we went to many of these other denominations trying to see what they believed. And I really, I'm a firm believer in this, and I was up in Canada this summer, uh, and one of the, none of your pastors, uh, uh, from Tilsonburg, um, he uh, made the statement, what's his name? Um, uh, Friesen, Pastor Friesen. He used to be Mennonite many years ago. And uh, he said that uh, he believes that when people get saved and they follow the Bible, they become Baptist. And I, th I, I guess I, I've kind of known that, you know, I didn't really, because I believe Baptists are biblical, the most biblical and so on. But I've never thought of it in light of that. And I, I've come to believe that that's very true. It's exactly what we did. As my parents studied and studied the Bible, they didn't know what the Baptists believe. And all of a sudden they went to a Baptist ordination service and they found out what they believed, and then they studied and studied the Bible with the Baptist preacher from that church. And they found out that's exactly what we believe. And, you know, they didn't know nearly everything. They, they still don't know everything, but, you know, we didn't know a lot. But we knew enough to know that when the Bible says something, that that's, it take, believe it literally. And there's no state church. No church is not a, the government over our lives. Anyway, so when you leave that and you follow that all the way and you do what the Bible teaches, you become Baptist. 
Not because Baptists are this special, you know, I don't believe, you know, I, I, they are special, don't get me wrong, but ba Baptists don't have something that in, not everybody else can have. We just have the Bible, we just believe what the Bible teaches. And so, if you follow that out, you become Baptist, you become a Bible believer. <clears throat> it's the closest group to identify with, with the Bible. And so, um, what you see is a lot of differences. You see Luther not going all the way. You see uh, Henry VIII leaving the Catholic Church for completely the wrong reason. And of course, they're basically the same as the Catholic Church, just a different head. Which, by the way, the Archbishop of Canterbury said something the other day. I saw a headline for it, and I can't remember what it was. It was something that... Uh, uh, I shouldn't say what it was. I can't remember what it was, but it was something ridiculous. <laughs> uh, totally not true. Um, anyway, so I just saw a headline for it. I didn't actually read the article. But So you have those left the Catholic Church for that reason. You have the person that we're going to discuss today is Zwingli, page 252 in your book if you have that. Zwingli, he left the Catholic Church as well and didn't follow that to the natural finish if you will. He didn't become a Baptist. Early on, he said some things that were very true and very right. And then as time went by, he went back and, um, uh, and started preaching and teaching the things that the Catholics had always taught. So we're going to see this, uh, this group here, Zwingli and Zurich, Switzerland. Let's pray and we'll Look at these. We're going to look at some of the background of Zwingli himself, the man. Then we'll look at some of the persecutions against Baptists that he perpetrated. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Help us as we look at these things today to gain more of an appreciation for your word and the fact that we have your word to count on. Lord, we're not Baptists because it's the thing to do. Lord, I believe that we're Baptists because we try to follow the Bible and believe the Bible literally. I ask that you bless our day now in Jesus' name. Amen. Ulrich Zwingli, he was a city chaplain in the city of Zurich in 1523. Now this is skipping a lot of his, uh, his earlier background. The winds of reform had made their way from, from Germany in 1517. Here it's 1523 and we're in Switzerland crossing the Alps. Uh, we don't have anybody from there now, but we had... Uh, Emmanuel a couple years ago uh, from uh, Switzerland. Zwingli, he also put out a statement of theses against the Catholic Church. Martin Luther, if you remember, he had his 95 theses that he posted on the door of the Wittenberg Church. Zwingli only had 67 things against the Catholic Church. <laughs> Uh, he also put out his, his list. <clears throat> and uh, one of the first theses of that 67 said this. Now, think about this and keep this in mind and, and what we studied today about Zwingli and what he practiced against the Anabaptists. One of the first theses said, All who say that the gospel is invalid without the confirmation of the church... Err and slander God. Think about that. All who say that the gospel is invalid without the confirmation of the church, err and slander God. So, <clears throat> he's saying that those who say that you have to have the confirmation of the Catholic Church, that that's wrong. By the way, of course, he's right. If you say that the Catholic Church has to confirm this teaching, the gospel, then you're wrong. And he's exactly right in saying that. The, the sad thing is that when it came his turn to be the head of their state church and their church, that he then didn't believe that anymore and said you have to have the confirmation of our church in order for you to practice your Christianity. And he persecuted those who went against his church. <clears throat> um, authorities gave him permission, Zwingli, gave him permission to continue his preaching in Switzerland, emphasizing, and these are two of the things that he stressed in his, in his preaching and teaching. 
<clears throat> Very simple things. Christ first and the church second. That was what he was known for early on in challenging the Catholic Church in Switzerland. Christ church, I'm sorry, Christ first and the church second. Here's another one of his theses, his 67 theses said, Christ is the only mediator between God and ourselves. Well, I agree. That's great that he saw that. But the problem was he didn't go beyond that then. He continued to have some priests in the founding of their religion, of course, the Reformed churches. Zwingli loved uh, his country uh, in his preaching. There's quite a few sources that you can find uh, that quote his preaching. It's kind of interesting. And in studying for this, I was reading through some of those. He talked a lot about, in his preaching, using examples of the Alps and the mountains and the Rhine River and so on like that. Um, he loved his country. But, uh, and he took it, his country, really, out of the Catholic Church. The country of Switzerland would become a Protestant country. <clears throat> Obviously so. Some things about uh, him in his early life. He was uh, a priest. He had graduated from the University of Basel in 1506. He was a priest. And uh, he was a very powerful preacher, according to the sources that I read. <clears throat> he was a very studious man, and uh, he taught himself Greek. He bought a copy of Erasmus's uh, Greek New Testament, and he memorized, he learned Greek, and then memorized long passages of Greek, uh, in the Greek. In 1519, he began preaching from the New Testament. His study of the, of the Word of God caused him to have a lot of doubt, of course, in the Catholic Church. And so he began to challenge, at least privately, some of the customs of the Catholic Church. And more and more, as time went along, he challenged some of these main ideas of the Catholics. Somewhere in there, I think it's, uh, yes, 1522... While he was a priest in the Catholic Church, he secretly married. He, he got married. That's obviously very uh, <laughs> illegal as a Catholic priest. He also that year broke the, the fast, the Lent, Lenten fast, by eating sausages in public. He also wrote against fasting for show. Fasting as in the way the Catholic Church interprets it. So this is 1522, 1523, he writes these theses. So he's a Catholic priest who challenged the system. Good for him, right? By 1523, he was ready to take his ideas to a larger audience. And in January, he did that by going to the Zurich City Council. He did this several times. This first time is called the first disputation where he disputed what the Catholic city council was teaching, what they believed, what they uh, claimed as far as their position of the state church. That was in January. His second disputation came in October. And he convinced a lot of people in the city of Zurich to challenge the Catholic church. Did a lot of good things that way. Um, some of the things that were done, images of Jesus and Mary and the saints were actually removed from Catholic churches. Why? Because the Bible is first and the church is second. By 1524, he insisted that pastors had the right to marry. Of course, he was married. By 1525, they convinced the city of Zurich to abolish the Mass. Okay, now this is already, what is this, eight years after Martin Luther, right? And Martin Luther didn't believe in abolishing the Mass. Martin Luther didn't even go this far, right? Martin Luther 
didn't believe in transubstantiation, but he believed in, you know, it's almost the same thing, consubstantiation. He conned everybody. I'm kidding. Uh, but consubstantiation where somehow it doesn't actually turn, but it's right that the presence of God is somehow mystically present. Again, that's not biblical. <clears throat> so, but he, he went further than, than Luther did, and he replaced transubstantiation and consubstantiation. He replaced the Mass with a simple service, including the Lord's Supper, as a symbolic memorial. That's what we just did on Sunday night here. Symbolic. There's nothing mystical about it. It's just uh, a memorial, a memory. Um, Luther and Zwingli actually met in 1529 at a meeting at Marburg, M-A-R-B-U-R-G. And um, they wanted to see if they could agree on enough things to stand together to fight against the Catholic Church, Germany and Switzerland. So uh, they, had, they, they brought it down to 15 points that they agreed and disagreed on, agreed, mostly agreed. The first 14, they agreed on all of them. The 15th had to do with the Lord's Supper. And they couldn't come to an agreement on this 15th point. Zwingli, of course, said it was symbolic, the Lord's Supper. Luther insisted that Christ is literally present. So Luther said that Zwingli, they, they left that meeting denouncing each other. Luther said that Zwingli was of the devil and he was nothing but a wormy nut. That's, of course, not in English. That was not spoken originally. Zwingli resented Luther treating him... Well, he uses some words that I'm not going to repeat in public. <laughs> Zwingli was a very fiery, outspoken preacher. Uh, and he uh, used, on numerous occasions, he used words that uh, are not fitting of a preacher. You can look these up, by the way, if you're really dying to know. <clears throat> It was evident that there was not going to be reconciliation between these two men, to say the least. So, Zwingli, this is 1529 when he met with Luther. In 1531, Zwingli died. Anybody know how he died? He died in battle against the Catholics. So, he was defending Zurich against Catholic forces. They were planning... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Catholics are trying to stop the Reformation and, uh, in Switzerland, and uh, Zurich was the, the battle scene for that. Zurich remained Protestant under the leadership of Zwingli's successor. This unique branch of the Reformation continued to move on. So that's kind of a, a general idea of, quick idea of the life of Zwingli and what he tried to accomplish came out of the Catholics, not nearly far enough. And some of the things that we're going to see here in our book show us that even though Zwingli did make some right steps, he, he uh, not only did he not go far enough, but then he continued to institute his own Protestant uh, church, state church, if you will, a Protestant state church, in Switzerland, persecuting against the Baptists and the Catholics and anybody who disagreed with him. Okay, so the, the liberty that they got from the Catholic Church, they didn't extend that liberty to others, put it simple. <clears throat> there were several Anabaptist leaders in Switzerland. They were associated with the Protestant Zwingli, in the beginning of his work in, in Zurich, after they left the Catholic Church, they all worked together at first. Zwingli basically stayed, uh, he kept the idea of a state church. These other Protestant leaders moved past that and became Anabaptists. And there are several names mentioned here. Conrad Grebel, Felix Manns, and George Kajakob. Associated with the Protestant Zwingli at first, and of course they eventually moved on beyond that. Another name you'll want to remember, Balthasar Hubmeyer. 
a great, these are all godly men from what we read in history. Uh, men who, several of them gave their lives in, in uh, uh, torture, tortured for their faith. 1524, uh, this is one issue, by the way, that didn't come up with Luther and with Zwingli in their meeting because they both agreed on it, and that is they both agreed on infant baptism. And the Anabaptists rejected infant baptism. Now, let's remind ourselves here, it's been a long time since we talked about this. What does infant baptism do for your state church? Sure, forces, absolutely. So when they're born, they're brought in against their own, they don't choose this, they are baptized into their religion. So they're forced in. And so this infant baptism is a foundational principle for the state church model. Everybody understand that? So if you go against infant baptism, you really are going to end up losing your state church over time, over a couple of generations. And so, again, I, as, as I read the Bible, can you remember the, some of the verses that they use to support infant baptism? Such and such was baptized... And their household. So, Acts chapter 16 uh, is one, the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16 also, right before that, was the uh, Lydia from Thyatira. Her and her household were baptized. And there's a few other examples, which says nothing about infants. So, I've always felt that this is such a political argument, which I hate politics and the whole, you just say what you have to say. Well, the support of infant baptism is not biblical. Anybody who's honest with the Bible knows that. The only reason they hold on to infant baptism is because they need it to support their state church model. So it's not realistic. It's not honest, in my opinion, humble opinion. <clears throat> anyway, anytime people who, who are not vested in the state church idea... And they study the Bible, they come to the conclusion that infant baptism is not biblical. And that's what Baptists have always believed and done. That's why Anabaptists, people who left other religions and became Baptists, they realize that they're not invested in a state church, so they end up believing in uh, baptism by immersion for salvation, not for salvation, uh, after salvation, not infant baptism. Anyway, by the end of eight, uh, 1524, Grable and Manz had taken a position against infant baptism and wanted to establish a true church composed of only regenerate members, regenerate baptized members, with a simple Lord's Supper. January of 1525, a disputation between Zingli and those opposed to infant baptism was conducted in Zurich before the city council. That's that first disputation. January 18th, this city council decreed that all infants must be baptized within eight days of birth, and those who did not baptize their infants would be ba banished from the city. Three days later, they put out another decree forbidding all opponents of infant baptism to even meet or speak in public. Ha, huh. yeah, okay, real nice. Squash all the opposition over infant baptism. Why? Because infant baptism, the support of infant baptism, supports the state church. And so Zwingli and his followers, being in charge of that state church, needed infant baptism to support it. Okay, so what did these men do? Grable, Manns, Kajacob, Balthazar Hubmeyer, others of like mind met together in defiance of the decree, but in obedience to the word of God. So what did they do? Well, they also, remember, they had come out of the Catholic Church. They had found the truth. They studied the Bible. They found that infant baptism was not in the Bible. So they began to baptize each other. Right? Why not? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Baptist briders don't like this. Um, those who believe that only certain 
you know, like you have this mystical presence or something that only it has to come down through the right line, your baptismal. Um, anyway. But they baptized each other. Could Jacob baptize by Grable upon confession of his faith? Could Jacob in turn then baptize the others? The baptism was by pouring, but they later adopted immersion. Why? Because they believed the Bible. <laughs> but they were doing what they knew at that point. Within a week, 35 more were baptized. Say, well, what had they done to this point? And what did they believe? They believed to this point that when they were baptized as an infant in the Catholic Church, that that was their baptism. And now they realize that it's not. My parents were baptized when they were 17 years old as a joining the Amish Church. It was the same concept, except their state church was not as powerful. <laughs> didn't have the backing of the police and so on. But it was certainly, I mean, there's no question that that whole religion is its own social circle. It's its own economy. It's its own everything. You know, you survive there in your little, I hate to call them a cult because I came out of it, but it's really what it is. You, you, you survive there in your own little group, your own little economy. It is a state church. It was. So anyway, they, they uh, stood up against that and baptized each other and were baptized. And of course, the Zwingli influenced city council began to persecute them more and more on this basis uh, that they didn't support infant baptism. Uh, look at uh, some of what they announced in March of that year. Uh, towards the bottom of page 253. We therefore ordain and require that hereafter all men, women, boys, and girls forsake rebaptism and shall not make use of it hereafter and shall let infants be baptized. Whoever shall act contrary to this public edict shall be fined for every offense. One mark. And if any be disobedient and stubborn, they shall be treated with severity for the obedient we will protect. The disobedient we will punish. <laughs> All right. So, uh, of course, these men, because they believed the Bible, they stood on what they believed and they were thrown into prison. Grable and Manns were thrown into prison, fed a diet of bread and water. And in December of 1527, a number of those leaders, including Manns, were put to death by drowning. And the joke was that they like immersion, so let us immerse them. We'll throw them in the water. Um, they accuse these men of trying to act smart. They think they're learned, but they don't know. By the way, this has been a ploy of the Catholic Church for a thousand years before this time. That you're too dumb to know the scriptures. The common people can't know what they believe. You're not smart enough. You need an education, so you, gotta, you have to be... Uh, have a degree and you have to be a priest and you have to be a person in the church before you're allowed to explain the Bible. Well, of course, they didn't explain the Bible. And so the common people, when they got a hold of the Bible for themselves and studied it, they found out that they weren't being told the truth. Well, so they, that's always been a way that they push down. They try to stamp out private study of the Bible. Um... That's exactly the accusation that people in Jerusalem brought against the disciples in Jesus' day, right after Jesus' day. Remember, they, they said that they were unlearned and ignorant men, Acts chapter 4. And the only thing they could say about them, I love this, they took knowledge of them, the disciples, that they had been with Jesus. They'd been with Jesus. Don't, don't be afraid to be called the common man. Don't be afraid to be called just an average. You're not smart enough to know that. Oh, yes. I'm convinced, and I've said this before, uh, the, the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 12 is filled with people that we have no idea what their names are in, in history. Filled. There's very, very few that we know their names. Uh, it's the average person that God has always worked through, I believe. 
So anyway, they accuse him of being dummies and, and not very smart and so on. Well, the truth is, Felix Manns was a very learned man and skilled in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Real dumb guy. You know, so. Anybody in here skilled in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew? Sarah? No. Caleb? He's skilled in French. I don't know about English. No. <laughs> So, all right, uh, number eight there, 254. Another Baptist that was tormented by those influenced in Zwingli Zurich was Balthazar Hubmeyer. A learned man had been a close friend with Zwingli in his earlier days. They fought together, literally, war against Roman Catholicism. But Hubmeyer went beyond Zwingli. Studying the Bible in all matters, he rejected infant baptism, said, you yeah, know, this is always the way it was where they said, you know, I'm not looking to be called a Baptist, but they obviously believe what I believe. So I guess I'm a Baptist. That seems like that's kind of a common theme. Hubmeyer wrote powerful books in defense of his faith. He wrote one in defense of believer's baptism as opposed to infant baptism. To baptize those who do not believe, I'm sorry, he said the command is to baptize those who believe. To baptize those who do not believe or are not capable of believing is forbidden. Of course, he was right. He wrote one against persecution concerning heretics and those that burned them. <laughs> uh, he wrote against persecution uh, for your faith. He said that the churches are supposed to be in the business of saving men, not burning them. Good point. So he was thrown into prison in 1526. He was kept there for four months. His appeal to his old friend Zwingli was ignored. His wife was uh, in prison. His health was broken. And he was put to the torture of the rack. April 6, 1526, he agreed to recant his beliefs. And you can read about this in more detail than here. Uh, he was summoned to the cathedral, and everybody said he's going to recant. And he had agreed that he would recant. And they bring up him to the front, and as he's getting ready to recant his beliefs, all of a sudden he breaks down weeping. He swayed to and fro in agony. He was suddenly strengthened by the Lord, and he shouted, Infant baptism is not of God, and men must be baptized by faith in Christ. Oops, so much for the recant. <laughs> oh, my son asked me the other day, uh, remember that story about uh, they would put children's, children in the stocks and then burn their feet to get the parents to recant? He said, I don't know what I would do. Think about it. I don't know what I would do. I told him, I said, I, have, I hope I would be faithful. I hope I wouldn't recant, but I, I hope to never be in that situation either. But if I was, I pray that God gives me the grace to go through that and to be faithful to Him. Rather have my faith, true faith, than to have my feet. Think about that. Be a, wow, difficult. And so he, he was faithful. He almost flinched and gave in, but he didn't. And he actually ended up getting out of prison there, and he lived for a number more years, a couple more years, in Vienna, Austria. He was burned to death at the stake then in 1528. His wife was drowned uh, and martyred as well. <clears throat> so, Zwingli didn't go far enough. It's bottom line. These other men went beyond him and became true Baptists. Well, what about Zwingli now? Um, about that time, Zwingli wrote a vicious book against the Anabaptists. It was called A Refutation of the Tricks of the Catabaptists or Drowners. He called them drowners because they baptized people. Yeah, remember I told you he called people mean and nasty names? There you go. It's right there in your book for you. <laughs> Uh, insulting terms and said that immersions were from hell and the Anabaptists themselves would go to hell. Wait a second, I thought you believed that, uh, as, a, as opposed to the Catholic Church, you believed that if you're saved by faith, 
And now you're saying that if you're not, that if you believe in immersing for baptism, that you're going to hell? Okay, this is reactionary. This is ridiculous. About that time, Baptist preachers like Conrad Grable and Eberl Pult preached with great success in Switzerland. Thousands came from throughout that part of the country to confess Christ and take part in believers' baptism. Isn't that great? Uh, true Bible believers, most of these thousands, we don't know their names, vast majority of them, um, but they took a stand also, and they took a big risk in standing with Conrad Grable and others and becoming rebaptized. By the way, our Baptist history, as you'll be in most, hopefully most of you next semester, Baptist history, um, it is full of people who were persecuted and gave their lives. Um, Baptist history is a persecuted history. Uh, very much so. And there's uh, very much evidence, obviously, in, in that uh, direction. So this Protestant Inquisition was very similar to the Catholic Inquisition. Isn't that sad? You come out of the Catholic Church for the wrong re oh, I'm sorry, for the right reason, you don't go far enough away from the Catholics and before long, you're doing the very same things that the Catholics had done to you. Zwingli was a hypocrite in the matter of persecution. He spoke against the Catholics when they persecuted Pro Protestants, but he supported the persecution of Baptists. Look at this in one of his 67 theses against Rome. Zwingli said this, no compulsion. What does that compulsion mean? You can't compel somebody. No compulsion forceful compulsion should be employed in the case of such as do not acknowledge their error unless by their seditious conduct they disturb the peace of others, end quote. So he said, you can't forcefully make somebody do something just because they believe it as long as they're not being seditious and turning your city rules upside down. Well, were Baptists seditious? Were they trying to create unrest in the community? No. They just wanted to have their own church services and meet and baptize each other. <laughs> What's so bad about that? But they took it upon themselves, the city council, under the influence of Zwingli, to make this a city issue. And once you did that, then you can accuse them of being seditious and going against the city rules. Baptists were not seditionists. They were not trying to overthrow the government. They wanted to practice their own faith. As late as 1671, 700 people were driven out of Bern. Great was their suffering. This is getting into Baptist history. Baptists just believed the truth. They believed the Bible. They didn't care about a state church. You know, they didn't care what the connection was between infant baptism. And, they didn't care about that. They just wanted to follow the Bible. Can we be like that? Uh, what a challenge that we just, we just got to follow the Bible. Stop trying to uh, play politics with the Word of God. That's really what that boils down to. They're playing politics with the Word of God. And so this group became a Protestant group, didn't go far enough from, away from the Catholic Church. Baptists were persecuted uh, originally a part of the group and then uh, left that group and were persecuted because of that. All right, the next group that we're going to look at then is Luther and actually, hang on. Um, actually, I'm not going to do that next. Um, our next section that we're going to look at is this uh, Counter-Reformation in uh, 1550, page 271. All right, we'll stop there for today. Any questions on Zwingli or this section on the Anabaptists? Yes? What, what would be his like, church name, I guess? Okay, good question. Uh, it's, the, it's the Reformed theology, and they, were, they became very Calvinistic, and, of course, that is Reformed theology, go hand in hand. Um, 
he didn't really have like a name. It wasn't, you know, like the Luther Lutherans. They didn't have the Zwingliites or anything, you know. It wasn't anything like that. But they did have their own theology, Reformed theology, John Calvin, Calvinistic teaching. Um, over in Scotland, uh, John Knox, right? Uh, there was teaching. They also had Reformed theology. Anyway, there was connections with other groups. But they, they were Reformed theology. Okay? No, no Zwingliites, right? Okay. You are dismissed. <laughs>